Hello and welcome to the First Right Podcast, your weekly dose of conservative news brought to you by Restoration of America. I'm your host, Hayden Ludwig, Research Director for Restoration News. Be sure to find our work at restoration-news.com. Today we're joined by Mark Weaver, a former Ohio Deputy Attorney General turned political strategist and author to discuss the left's about face on Joe Biden, the swift coronation of Kamala Harris, and what we can do to defeat her this November. Mark, we appreciate you coming on the show. It's always great to be back. Thank you. Now, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happened, and it seems like every week in 2024 is one such week. Nobody was shocked by the Democrats' sudden decision to oust Joe Biden from the presidential election and replace him with Kamala Harris just 100 days out from Election Day, and it's stunning when you think how risky a strategy is. Mark, I don't recall a time when a political party has ever pulled this kind of bait and switch and actually managed to win the election. Are you aware of any such time? No, I've never seen anything like it. But this is a reminder that political parties will typically do whatever they have to to stay in power. And that includes, as we now know, jettisoning a sitting president, the leader of their party. He would he didn't jump. He was pushed, and that's because when the congressional Democrats started getting back polling data that said that Joe Biden's lack of cognitive ability and lack of the ability to lead our country was hurting them personally, only then did they take action to get him off the ticket. So it's remarkable that that we've seen it with our own eyes. So the party of democracy is really, of course, driven by naked political self-interest. I'm shocked by that. Such irony that the small, the big D Democrats don't care about small D democracy. (laughs) Now, at the same time, as of recording anyway, Kamala's poll numbers are at or even surpassing Donald Trump's both nationally and in all of the important swing states. And this has people understandably nervous. Mark, is this the pl- the left's plan actually working, or is this a honeymoon phase that's going to fizzle out in the near future? I've heard honeymoon. I've heard sugar high. There's lots of wise ways to describe this. What I've told reporters who've called me over the last several days is Joe Biden was the anchor holding down Democrats well below the ocean surface. And so when they let go of him, there's going to be a natural rising up, and that's what we're seeing with Kamala Harris and now her new running mate, Tim Walls. Uh, So there will be this initial burst of energy, but when you scratch the surface surface of either of these two candidates, you find a hard left ideologue. Walls himself is an apologist for socialism, uh, kind of a younger version of Bernie Sanders. And as a result, the more Americans get to know Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, the less they will like them. Yeah, it seems like right up to now, most Americans have had very little um, screen time with Kamala as the presidential front runner. I mean, let's not forget, she ran for the presidential nominee slot in 2020, dropped out after the first primary debate, didn't win a single primary vote. In a lot of sense, she's an untested candidate, which, you know, you'd think would make the, the gambit a little riskier for the Democrats to nominate her. She's a deeply unserious political candidate. All you need to do is look at her political history. She's never really had a difficult race in a general election setting. That's she right. was essentially brought into power by people behind her who wanted to take advantage of her position. We're seeing that now potentially with the Obamas and maybe other and the others in the Democratic Party. And if you allow her to speak unscripted, that's when you can tell that she simply doesn't have the gravitas or the ability to lead this country. Let's talk about Harris's background. So she was, of course, a U.S. Senator before she was vice president. Before that, she was California Attorney General. And before that, she was district attorney for the city of San Francisco. Um, It sure seems like on every issue, she's about as far left as you could possibly be, famously beating up Joe Biden in the 2020 primaries for not being left wing enough on a number of issues endorses things like slavery reparations in California, a state where slavery was never legal. Um, It seems to me, Mark, that people hate all the issues that she stands for, but are voters connecting those issues back to Kamala Harris? Yeah, I think they will as they they take a closer look. 
What's interesting is we've seen Americans get more focused on politics than they have in the last several years. And as a result, they are likely to read more, listen more, and watch more about this, this new person who's the head of the Democratic Party, Kamala Harris. And anyone who's been to California knows it's one of our most beautiful states, but it's probably our worst governed state. And much of that comes from her track record in that state. So her, her positions are well outside of the mainstream. Her ability to articulate a vision for America is among the worst I've ever seen from a national leader. And she has such fissures and and uh, breakages within the Democratic Party. She's going to have a difficult time keeping that coalition together, particularly after she snubbed Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, who I've known for 20 years, is from my hometown, who really is a very skilled candidate. I disagree with him on all the issues, of course, but he's a skilled candidate. She originally was going to have an, his, his announcement in his hometown of Philadelphia. That's why they schedule it there. But the far left of her party came to her and essentially threatened her that if, if she were to choose a Jewish candidate for her VP, somebody who stands with Israel in many respects, that they would walk out of the convention in Chicago. So she's got a fractured Democratic Party she has to preside over. And it doesn't speak well of her campaign instincts that she is still planning her first major rally in Pennsylvania, if I understand that correctly. Is this not a snub to Josh Shapiro when you're picking a far left governor that very few people have heard of from Minnesota, which traditionally anyway has not been a swing state for Republicans or Democrats? Does this speak to some kind of master plan or is this just a moronic move by somebody who's operating, you know, minute by minute? Well, to the extent that there's any strategy at all, let's give her a little bit of benefit of the doubt and suggest that there's some strategist who knows what he or she is doing in the mix here. What they probably said was, we are not strong enough to move into swing states like Pennsylvania. We still have to shore up dark blue states like Minnesota. That's troubling. Uh, if they were really confident of that these recent poll numbers being uh, actual, so they're going to stick, they would have said, let's reach out into Pennsylvania. Let's reach out into Arizona. Let's reach out into North Carolina, which are much more purple states. So choosing a blue state governor with a hard left record is an indicator that job number one for the Harris campaign was to secure their base. And it's awfully late in the game to be securing your base. Well, certainly the one group that's not going to be, they're not going to miss the snub for not picking Josh Shapiro are Democratic Jews, liberal Jews, right? In states like New Jersey and New York, I've heard people suggest that now Trump, who is at least within striking distance in the last polls that I saw, you know, they are really seriously in play, or at least there's a group of Democratic voters that are critical to that party's coalition that may sit this one out. What's your take on that? Well, Orthodox Jews and conservative Jews were already trending Republican. That's happened for years. But yes. this large group of reform Jews, and I'm from the Philadelphia suburbs, for example, which is a very blue area. It was red when I lived there as a younger person, but it's blue now. There's a large percentage of reform Jews who are very unhappy of this administration's stance toward Israel and their refusal to really stand up to Hamas and bring back our hostages and stand with the prime minister of Israel. So they were already discouraged and disappointed with the Democrats. And now to take Josh Shapiro, who would have been, a, like I said, a very skilled running mate for Kamala Harris, to snub him like that, that's going to move a significant number of these Jews who were already moving in the direction of considering voting for Trump. It's going to mean more votes from the Reform Jewish co Coalition. And now, staying with this topic, it's interesting to me that while open borders, uh, immigration, and the economy and inflation these are consistently the highest polling issues on voters' minds right now. And nevertheless, you just watched a, the nominee of a major political party choose her vice president, everybody seems to agree, based solely on the Israel-Hamas question. So Mark, what, what does that say to what, what size of factor the Israel-Gaza war is right now in this presidential election? Well, let's not forget that the first anniversary of the attack on Israel is going to happen as people are early voting in some of these key states. So October 7th is going to come up. 
reminds me a little bit of 1980. I'm, I'm, I'm older than you, and I was a very young man at the time, still a student. But in 1980, the anniversary of the hostages being taken by the radicals at Iran fell mm. on the Sunday before the election. And it was a reminder to Americans that Jimmy Carter wasn't able to get these American hostages out and that he allowed this to fester. It's one of the reasons why Ronald Reagan won in 1980. So there are some parallels that when we uh, commemorate, if you will, the October 7th invasion and slaughter, a lot of Americans will be, will be reminded that Joe Biden did very little to stand with Israel. And I hope our American hostages are back before then. Certainly that would be great if they would come back today. But if they're not, it's a reminder that the Biden-Harris administration didn't do enough to get our people back. And speaking of being sympathetic to Gaza and Hamas, let's talk about Tim Waltz. So we know he's for a two-state solution, but give us a background on who this guy is. Introduce our listeners to this socialist Minnesota governor. Yeah, he was in the Army, and we thank him for his service. Although today I saw that some of the people he served with have put out an open letter saying that he uh, left their unit before it went into a key mission and, and resigned wow. his uh, commission for politics. And so I would encourage people to hear not what I have to say, but those who served with him have to say. But his statements suggest a very hard left position, and his actions as governor suggest a hard left position. For example, we know the border is a very important issue to most Americans, right up there with the economy. And he was the governor who signed the law that said illegal immigrants can get driver's licenses. We're going to see stories, heartbreaking stories, of Americans who've been killed by illegal aliens driving cars. And Tim Walls' solution was to give them a driver's license, which, by the way, also gives them identification to take advantage of America's social welfare system or to get onto uh, airplanes or secure areas where you couldn't get into without it. Uh, an official government ID. So once we see his record up close, you're going to see it's a record of hard left. He, he defending socialism the other day, saying saying it's essentially like being a good neighbor. Uh, yes. And the, the history of socialism tells us something much different, of course. Uh, like Venezuela being such a good neighbor, right? Or or Cuba, for instance. Unreal. Huh. Yeah, it's very troubling. Anybody who knows the history of socialism knows that people suffer. We're seeing it now even in our own hemisphere. People suffer and starve under socialism. Bernie Sanders has been an unabashed socialist. And Tim Walls is really just a younger version of Bernie Sanders. In fact, I saw a clip recently where Bernie Sanders was encouraging Kamala Harris to pick Tim Walls as her running mate. And so it looks like uh, the squad and Bernie Sanders have got their favorite VP pick from Kamala Harris, which tells us she doesn't have control of her party in a way that responsible political leaders should have control over their party. Sanders, of course, honeymooned in the Soviet Union very famously. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there. You know, uh, interesting place where these two issues, um, Hamas and the Gaza war and open borders kind of collide, of course, is Minneapolis. Um, the FBI considers it the terror recruitment capital of the United States, obviously for the massive Somali population living there. Uh, we also know that recently Tim Waltz oversaw changing the flag to something that looks suspiciously like the flag of, of Somalia. We also know that uh, Representative Ilhan Omar is from Minnesota and has given uh, speeches to the effect of make America Mogadishu or make Somalia great again. I mean, People aren't familiar with this in other parts of the country, but people who come from the upper Midwest certainly are. Uh, what kind of introductory tactics do Republicans need to make use of to teach people in North Carolina and Arizona and Georgia and Pennsylvania just how insane these leftists really are? Yeah, even the leftist mayor of Minneapolis um, had to come out and admit that he had asked Tim Walls when he was governor during the riots to bring in the National Guard. That is the complete decision of a governor to decide whether to deploy the National Guard. And Walls refused to. And we saw a proud American city burning. We saw police departments evacuated. We saw police under attack. We saw small businesses burned to the ground, uh, all under Tim Walls's watch all the time when he was essentially standing in solidarity with those who were destroying the biggest city in his state. And the mayor asked for help and didn't get it from Tim Walls. So we'll be coming up on several anniversaries of four years ago of when that happened. And those should be looked at by Americans before they cast their vote. 
let's pivot a little bit to talk about the the battleground states. So give us an overview of, in your estimation, maybe even polls withstanding, where do Trump and Harris stand right now in all of the important states that are likely to swing red or blue as things are looking right now? To the extent that we've seen an increase in Kamala Harris's numbers nationally, and we have because Biden's Biden was dragging down the Democrat ticket so badly, as I've mentioned, like an anchor, if you will, in deep water, we're seeing less of that effect in some of the key swing states. When I, when I think swing states, I think Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina are the ones that immediately come to mind. The, the, the polls are much closer in those states. And remember, when you look at these national numbers, when you see the Democrats ahead by four or five points in the national polls, that's a suggestion they could probably win the Electoral College. When it's mm. essentially tied, or if the Democrats are behind, that's almost guaranteed the Republicans will, will win in the Electoral College because there's all these millions of overvotes in California and New York, which are dark blue states. And they're gonna cast many more votes into that national number, but it won't get any more electoral votes because they're gonna get California and New York electoral votes no matter what. So A, I think the polls are gonna be shifting. Let's look at where the polls are in a few weeks when things settle down. B, in order for the Democrats to win, you have to have that national number up by plus four or plus five to really give them a chance of winning the Electoral College. But here's the thing we probably all recognize. There's going to be another five or ten crazy political twists and turns between <laughs> now and Election Day that none yes. of us is predicting. I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what they're going to be. I can tell you there's going to be more to come, which will potentially shake up the numbers a little bit. Oh, only 10, you think? I mean, at this rate, it's every <laughs> week. Right. Well, we can all catch our breath and hope for 10, right? N yeah, no doubt about it, right. Well, you know, a lot of interesting analysis that I've read suggests that there, the closest parallel as things stand right now might actually be the 1988 presidential election, where if I wasn't around for this one, but is my understanding is that Michael Dukakis, far left liberal, was substantially leading George H.W. Bush at this point in August 1988. But by mid-September, when people had come to understand just how out of touch with the average American voter he really is, Dukakis's lead vanished, and George H.W. Bush ended up winning in a landslide, the biggest landslide in every presidential election since then. Do you see any parallels, or is this just wishful thinking on my part? Well, there are some parallels. Uh, Dukakis was the governor of Massachusetts. He was coining what he called the Massachusetts miracle. But the, uh, the ad makers and the message gurus for George H.W. Bush, most of whom had worked with Reagan, uh, were able to train their fire directly on what happened in Massachusetts. And when the voters found out the truth, the most uh, infamous one, of course, was Dukakis's policy that allowed murderers who were in prison for life to get out for a weekend, to go out in the community and do whatever they wanted to do. And one wow. of them, Willie Horton, famously, uh, raped and assaulted a young couple and there were other examples as well this is this reminds us of the value of message discipline and so president trump hadn't called has not called me this morning for his daily uh, message boost from me i'm kidding <laughs> but if he did i would encourage him to remain disciplined and focused on the messages americans care about which is the biden harris disastrous record on the economy the Biden-Harris disastrous record on the border and how that impacts everyday families in states like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Michigan. If Donald Trump and J.D. Vance can do that, they will be back in the White House in January. Is there reason to think that Trump and now Vance are running actually a tighter, more disciplined campaign, at least messaging-wise, than they did in 2016 or 2020? I think so. Certainly some of the pros who've, who've risen to the top of Trump world are people who I respect and do understand things like message discipline. And we have seen some great moments where Trump has stayed on message or has held back and allowed the Democrats to continue to fight among themselves or, or have a, a problem where they're dominating the news. And so if he does that more, I think that's going to be helpful. There's every reason to believe that J.D. Vance was a strong pick for Trump because all of these uh, press reports who are coming to him and asking for him to respond to the latest scandal about what 
Donald Trump has said, Vance has made an articulate, passionate, and well-reasoned response in a way that shows what Donald Trump was saw when he when he picked J.D. Vance to be his VP. So how does that strategy need to evolve from facing Joe Biden to Kamala Harris? Because this remains the same administration. It is the Biden-Harris administration. She obviously was put in charge of the border, whether she was called border czar or not, doesn't really matter. What's the evolution that needs to happen or does there really need to be an evolution? Well, you've raised a very important point. Let's not fight about the term borders are. That's what the press uh, wants us to do. Right. She was in charge of the problem at the border, and it's the biggest failure in modern American history. And the economy, you know, it's not just the stock market, even though we've seen the stock market on the decline, it's the grocery store, it's the gas pump, it's mortgage rates. This is stuff that everyday Americans understand. So we need to remind people that it is this administration's track record, Biden and Harris, which has given misery to so many American families. It's how Ronald Reagan ended his debate against Jimmy Carter in 1980. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? And uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of Americans thought to themselves, I'm not any better, I'm worse off. And when we ask that question this year, people who are honest and not blinded by partisanship have to say things were better when Trump was in the White House. And that could be the key to uh, Donald Trump coming back to the White House. Now, on the flip side, how do you expect the Harris campaign to own or try not to own the baggage of the last four years? Uh, well, we can predict a couple of things with, with confidence. Number one, she will begin to separate herself and create some distance between her and Joe Biden. She'll say things like, to the extent that she'll do an interview, by the way, which is right. an open question right about now, <laughs> but to the extent that she'll do an interview, she'll say, I wasn't in the room for that decision, or uh, I expressed privately my disagreement with that decision, or I respect Joe Biden, but that was his decision. So you will see her try to separate away from the unpopularity of Joe Biden. It's hard for her to do because Joe Biden has said that she was a partner in all the major decisions. Certainly the pullout from Afghanistan, one of the most disastrous foreign policy events of the modern era. Uh, she was the last one in the room and fully on board with what happened there. Bragging so she'll about have trouble. It. Yeah, she's bragging about it. In fact, we'll, we'll, I don't know that we'll have a debate between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. I hope we will. But I do know there'll be a debate between what Kamala Harris says now and what Kamala Harris has said in the last <laughs> few years, because that'll be directly at odds in a way that even more so than when she debates Donald Trump. What's been interesting to watch, too, is almost from the moment, well, actually, actually at the moment that, that it was announced that Biden <laughs> tweeted out that I'm not running for president anymore, the entire conservative media apparatus switched on a dime to hitting Kamala, because, of course, they'd been anticipating this for months or even years leading up to this moment. That hasn't been the issue, but there's an open question about whether the smartest strategy, to your point, the, the discipline strategy involves taking every possible shot you can at her. The thing I have in mind is calling her the DEI hire. Now, of course, that's accurate in the sense that she really is chosen for qualities of the merit. But Mark, is that really the soundest strategy the conservatives should take? Or should we stick to those top level issues, the economy, inflation, the border, maybe Hamas, and ignore all of these other more tempting but lesser, more petty attacks. Yeah, you're speaking of message discipline. And while it's uh, undeniable that she was chosen for her, her skin color and for her gender, uh, Joe Biden has told us that. Don't take my word for that. This is Joe Biden's words. Uh, that's not our best line uh, of attack on her because it allows the, the Democrats and their friends in the press to falsely cry racism falsely hmm. cry racism. And so rather than have that sort of distracting fight, our better uh, line of criticism is the economy, the border, and here's one we haven't discussed, what she knew about Joe Biden's lack of cognitive abilities and why she went out and lied and said he was completely with it. That goes directly to an issue that every American understands. Every American understands he's cognitively impaired. And no American likes to be lied at, lied to by a political leader. Uh, 
And so she went out and lied. It can't be it can't be the case that she's in all the meetings with him and not have noticed that he's unaware of his surroundings on many occasions. She went out and lied about that. Those are three key message points, the economy, the border, and why she lied and covered up his cognitive impairments. Well, let's not forget, she testified multiple times to the media that her boss is sharp as a tack, that he's running circles around junior staffers when we find out he works, what, six or eight hours a day at the most, right? 10 to 4 president. So yeah, absolutely, she needs to answer those. And you'd think a debate stage would be the ideal place to do that. But do you think this is going to be a 2020 repeat, the kind of basement campaign strategy the left prefers? Or will she not be able to get away with skipping a debate? She certainly looks like she's doing a replay of 2020, where she will. Here, here's the uh, the calculus probably going on the head of of their strategy team. Like Joe Biden, they knew they couldn't roll him out for actual encounters because he would show that he wasn't up to the job. Kamala Harris is also not up to the job, but for different reasons. I think she probably is cognitively with it. She just can't form sentences well or declare a vision for the country or do anything other than pair hard left talking points that helped her in California, but hurt her with the rest of the country. So in order in both cases, 2020 and 2024, to shield uh, those candidates from the public, they do overly scripted events and they are willing to take on the criticism certainly of Republicans and maybe a few honest brokers in the press who will say they're hiding her from us. They are keeping her from any difficult encounter. They're willing to take that criticism if she can just slip by based on uh, politics of, of skin color, politics of gender, identity politics, and hope that that's enough to get her through in November. Now, speaking of debates, how do you anticipate a hypothetical debate between Tim Waltz and J.D. Vance playing out? We don't know anything about Waltz's debating skills, but he's obviously done it before. Uh, what's his performance like that we should expect? Waltz seems feisty to me. I don't know him well. I told you I know Josh Shapiro well, but I don't know Waltz well. But every clip I've seen of him, the guy has got a feistiness to him, which uh, white working class voters kind of like a fighter. Yeah. Watch, he's going to play up his military history. So it's going to be like, I'm the tough vet who just calls it as it is. And if I step on toes, that's because I care about the working man. That'll be his, <laughs> his little shtick, if you will. Uh, so I, I expect we'll see that in the debate. Now, it will be hard to call out J.D. Vance as a snooty Yale law school elite, even though J.D. went to Yale Law School, because J.D. Vance's story of coming up from such humble beginnings in such a, a difficult home environment is so well known by Americans. He had a best-selling book. You had a movie that, that uh, many people saw. And so it will be difficult for him, meaning Walsh, to tut-tut uh, J.D. Vance as a tech uh, tech exec elite guy who doesn't really understand. So final question as we close out here, as of recording, we are about to head into the Democrats convention here. Uh, for those unfamiliar, walk us through what we should expect because this is not a convention like anybody's used to. Yeah, I certainly hope that uh, there is no violence in Chicago. I don't want anybody to get hurt I don't want any property to be destroyed. But you have to imagine that Antifa, um, Hamas, and other radicals will be there because there's 2,000 cameras there. And uh, they want the attention of the world. Look for the Democrats to try to manage the most extreme voices in their party so that it looks like a wonderful family reunion. We're all, we're all in this together, but some of these voices will find a way to uh, speak out and it will not be a very smooth convention. Fascinating. Mark Weaver, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure and an eye opener. Thank you. Always great to be with you. And let me thank you folks for tuning in, supporting conservative voices, working to expose the truth about the rot spreading through this once great country. Remember that it's only by working together and by praying together that we can restore the United States of America to greatness under almighty and sovereign God. I'm Hayden Ludwig. Join us next time as the battle rages on. First Right, a new kind of news summary without the liberal slant. Every morning, in your inbox, always free. 
Subscribe by texting FIRST RIGHT to 30161. That's FIRST RIGHT, all caps, one word, to 30161.